us to live up to this scripture. Help us to be what you are, Lord. To love each other, to forgive each other, to let it go, to encourage each other, not to think we're better than anyone else. Lord, and help us to love those around us, those that are persecuting us at times, who don't believe in you. God, help us to love the way you love. And help us to stand the way you stand and not to compromise. God, teach us how to navigate in 2023. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. <clears throat> Marvin was a good guy. Marvin was a good guy. He lived in a little town called Granby, Colorado, about the same size as Westlock. And he had a muffler shop. And people liked him. He had a good reputation. He was the kind of guy that would give you the shirt off his back. He was one of us. But Marvin had trouble letting things go. Maybe you have trouble letting things go. I know I have, for sure. It started with a disagreement with the local municipal government, you know, like David Truckee and those guys that are here in town, right? And he had a disagreement. And what happened was he bought a piece of land at an auction sale because he was going to use it to expand his muffler, his little muffler business. And one of the guys that was on the town council wanted that piece of land and was kind of angry. Does this sound kind of, <laughs> you know, these kind of things happen in small towns, don't they? And so the guy that was on the town council wanted that piece of land and he was a little bit upset that this new guy got this piece of land and Marvin got this piece of land and all of a sudden Marvin got hit with a $40,000 bill because he needed a new sewer system. Now maybe he was actually sinned against. It does sound suspicious, doesn't it? And so all of a sudden, Marvin had to put in a new sewer system or he wasn't allowed to use that land. And he said, well, look, I don't even want a bathroom on there. I'm just using it to store stuff. No, you've got to have a sewer system. So he got mad. Marvin got mad. And he had trouble letting it go. And he kept going to the town council. He took it to court and he lost. And he felt like all these guys were against him. And he didn't have justice and he wanted justice. And the system let him down. And the more the system let him down, the more angry he got. Till finally, this is a true story, he went out and bought a DC, uh, D3 cat. Now you can see what he did. For 18 months, Marvin was angry. And he went to his shop and he wasn't doing mufflers anymore. He was welding a tank. This good guy that'll give you the shirt off his back, that'd like to go cross-country skiing. And he welded iron plates all around this DC-3 tank cat every day for 18 months. And he filled in with cement. There's cement underneath that. There was no way, you know, it was bulletproof. That thing was a tank. This is a true story. And in June, June 3rd or June 4th of 2004, Marvin took the word payback to a whole new level. <laughs> a whole new level. There's Marvin. A good man pushed past reason. Now, the question I have for you, and I ask myself this question too, are you building a tank in your garage or better yet are you building a tank in your heart nope. no i i hope that that answer is no because we can spend time thinking about how to pay back when somebody sins against you and your whole muffler business is ignored your whole life is ignored and what happens when we do that on 2004, Marvin went into his homemade tank and he welded the trap door shut. He was not planning out coming out alive. 
He had made up his mind that he was going to get justice. And if it took his life to do it, he was going to do it. And his plan worked perfectly. This is an amazing story. So that you can imagine a small town police force as he's driving this tank into his nemesis's his enemy's buildings. So he went to the former mayor's house and leveled it. Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to do that? Wouldn't, isn't there a part of you that goes, yeah, right? There's part of me that goes, wow, Marvin, wow. You know, there's a little bit of respect that I have. But, but what did it gain him? And then he went to the hardware store. Well, first of all, he leveled his, the guy that, the guy was on town council that wanted that piece of land. He leveled his business. He had a cement business, leveled it. And the police were shooting at him and you know, they couldn't do nothing. And he made national news, of course. Homemade tank rampage. We might need a SWAT team, was that? <laughs> Was, was, you know, <laughs> and and so this was a, his plan. I got hurt, so I am gonna hurt back. I got hurt, so I'm gonna hurt back. People are gonna pay for what they did to me. Yeah, right. mm. But what good does that do? Now, in all honesty, I did this. I never built a tank. But I decided, I've done this more than once, and I bet you you have too. I got hurt, and I'm gonna make sure they pay. And there's various ways you can build a tank. There's various ways you can make them pay, pay back. You can just leak your story into the community. And your story will be your side of the story. And your story might include some truth and some untruth, some exaggerations. Your story might include some slander. Your story might include some gossip. And you can try to get people on your side and try to hurt that person's reputation. I've done this where I've wasted years focusing on punishing others instead of putting God, putting it in God's hands. Now we read that. Vic read from Romans, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Unforgiveness never brings peace. There he is, ramming the local hardware store. And what finally happened to Marvin is he rammed the local hardware store and it had a basement and he fell into the basement. And when he fell into the basement, he was trapped. Trapped in his own prison that he had made himself. This is what happens when we don't forgive. We build our own tank and we try to hurt others, and we end up building our own prison, and we ignore our life. We ignore what counts. We ignore God. We ignore His uh, choosing you to be the salt of the earth, choosing you to be the light of the world. We ignore your abundant life that He has for you, and you get trapped in your own prison, and you know what happens? You die. You die, and Marvin died. Unforgiveness never brings peace. It always steals your time, your joy, your life, and eventually it leaves you dead, trapped inside a prison that you built yourself. Unforgiveness, unforgiveness, unforgiveness. After getting trapped in the basement of the hardware store uh, that he was in process of destroying, Marvin ended his life inside the prison that he made himself. And the police snuck up on him and they had a hard time even getting to him. They had to bring in a, a cutting torch to even get inside. 18 months every day. Boy, if you guys ever feel that bad, please come and talk to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I can spare you a lot of money, a lot of pain, a lot of time, a lot of nonsense that really does nothing. Marvin was angry about thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours that the municipal government forced him to spend upgrading his sewer system and his anger and unforgiveness ended up costing him his life. I think the $40,000 wasn't worth it, was it? Yeah, the land wasn't worth it. Colossians 3, 13 to 15. It's all about Jesus, part 10, get over it. Get over it. 
So this is really short, really simple, but hard to implement. So as we're talking about this, I want you to think about if there's any bulldozers that you're building in your heart, and maybe we need to redirect your energy into serving God instead of building bulldozers. Because bulldozers are a waste of time. There is a bulldozer, and God wields that one. And when it's time, he, d he does bring judgment. And we can trust him for that. And the reason you trust God is because if he wants to forgive them and he brings them to the cross, then he will forgive those people. And that's what he ultimately wants. And if they really are um, seeking to be forgiven, they will go back to Marvin or you and say, I'm sorry. And how can I make that right with you? And that's what God's plan is. But if they don't, if they just continue to, to hurt you and hurt others, God will bring justice. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah is a good place to start. When it, the character of God says, hey, Abraham says, if, if there's 50 people, will you destroy it? He said, no, I'll spare it for 50 people. If there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 20, if there's 10, the character of God is extremely patient, extremely loving, extremely kind. But when there's no hope, when there's no hope of salvation for those little babies, when there's no hope of salvation for those mothers, when there's no hope of salvation for the world, Jesus will come back and he will have a sword in his mouth and he will destroy this world. He will, he will bring vengeance. But that's his job. That's not our job. There's no way we could do that job because we don't know if there's hope. We don't know if somebody has hope for salvation or somebody has hope to turn their life around 30 years from now. We have no idea of knowing. We can't do vengeance. We have to let it go. We have to let it go. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Point one, you must forgive others. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Some people just rub you the wrong way. There are some things that will, as we get closer together, you can get irritated by people. And that's okay. Our little church here, it's, it's, we, we are family. And we get close. I've been to churches where you don't even really meet other people. You hardly even know them. And our church has, I think it's wonderful. We have long-haired people and conservative people that love each other. We have charismatic people, Pentecostal people, and Catholic background people that love each other. That's hard. We have people that grew up in a Lutheran church. Brian, you, you grew up in a Lutheran church. And then we have people that were Anglican. Lindsay, you, you went to an Anglican church. Well, a little bit. Um, that's not really what you are, but... I went to every church. You went to every church. <laughs> the Jehovah Witnesses. Well, except for the Jehovah Witnesses. I haven't been there yet. Well, and I like that. I like that because, because the truth is the Bible doesn't talk about Catholic, Baptist, Pentecostal. It doesn't talk about membership. The Bible talks about you love Jesus and you're a brother and sister, or you don't love Jesus and you're not a brother or sister. We are all unsaved and some of us are saved because of Christ and some of us aren't because, you know, you can argue, was it our choice, was it his choice? But the bottom line is there's only two kinds of people, sinners that are saved and sinners that aren't saved. So when you have this family and you're getting along and you're close, you can rub each other the wrong way. I, I have a redneck background. I don't know if you guys realize that. I, I think there's two kinds of people. There's hoity-toity people those people don't burn styrofoam, <laughs> you know, those people don't burn cardboard, right? And then there's redneck people. And, and we're both, you know, Christians if you're saved. So is one right, is one wrong? You know, I have certain phrases that set me off like, you know, you guys are going to, I'll just be honest with you, gluten-free. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't be mad at me. You know, I've had to learn how to love and
and realize that, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe there are people that can't eat wheat. There are. I have a daughter. There, there you go. There you go. And I have now got a friend, Morgan, who I think we have found is gluten-free. So I've had to, what should I say, lighten up my redneck background and understand that gluten-free is something that exists. There's, there's other phrases that really set me off. Theistic evolution. You guys ever heard that term? Theistic evolution. Oh, that one sets me off. When I went to Bible school, uh, most people were theistic evolutionists, which means God created the world in 100, 450 billion years. And he was there and he did this and that, but everything was kind of like, you know, and I, I believe the world was created in six days. I'm sorry. But I've had to sit back and go, you know, some of these people were my professors, right? And I got in trouble because I kept standing up. What do you guys do? What is this? this is crap. You know? But I had to go, oh, we don't know everything. And I had to learn to love people. I will still, you know, stand firm on that doctrine of six day creation. But you love Jesus? Okay. Okay. I know I don't have everything correct. I'm a man. I'm sure that there's things that I don't have, you know, perfectly about how God works. I don't know. You know, I, one of the things that sets me off the most is, can you give me a hand moving tomorrow? It shouldn't take long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some things are not worth fighting for. Some things we, we, we're not even worth bringing up. When somebody says it's gluten free, it's, it's not, I shouldn't even bring it up. Oh, we've been eating wheat for thousands of years and now you can't eat wheat I don't I don't need to talk about it I can let it go I can I can I can have compassion and understanding I can just let it go I don't even have to bring it up some things aren't worth fighting about choose to love I think that's what make allowance for each other's faults some character flaws in me if you love me you let it go and sometimes you need to stand up to me now, a good way to know this, first of all, you got to hear from the Holy Spirit before you go to someone in love. Anyone, I'm going to talk more about that in a bit here, but anyone who's ever, if, if, you're, if somebody's hurting a lot of other people, more than likely God wants you to confront that person. Does that make sense? But it must be in love. If, if it's just hurting you, let it go doesn't matter. See, that's what I do. And I think it's a good way. But really, we got to hear from the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's saying, okay. But do you think Marvin heard the Holy Spirit go build, you know, a tank and rip down the mayor's? Well, maybe, right? Maybe. But I, 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 I don't think he wanted him to end his life. He landed in a basement. He landed in a basement. Yeah. I, I think that we all need to, a lot of things we let it go. Like anyone who's ever been married knows that, that there are little cultural differences and habits that you got to just overlook. You just don't harp on them. Like taste in music. That can divide churches, by the way. Taste in music can absolutely split churches. You know, I, I, I've seen churches split over having a drum set. I've seen churches back in my day that were split over acoustic guitar. They, they didn't allow acoustic guitars. And you know, you gotta have love because it's culture too. And I think in the, in, when it comes to music, I think we have to honor our elders, that's very important. I think honoring your elders comes into play. But the elders also have to love the younger people. So it's about love, you see? And tasting clothing. You know, my mom and dad in the 70s went to Fiji and the women don't wear shirts at all and they go to church and they're just sitting there you know that's a different culture right and my mom and dad are like whoa where do you look? what do you do where do you look right what do you do hey it's a different culture you close your eyes and work that yeah my dad became a pentecost overnight at that point 
<laughs> he he said that you just got you got to where you just realized that you had to forgive that that's how they are that's what their culture is i think it does come into play the way people dress and and the culture of the hippies is different than the culture that my mom and dad came from i come from kind of the hippie culture that's actually what what influenced me you know that does that is that good i, I think there's there were some good things about the hippie culture there was a, a lot of bad things about the hippie culture there were good things about my mom and dad's culture there were bad things about my mom and dad's culture but can we love each other and i think our church does a good job you know we've had we've had uh, all kinds of things that divide us should the toilet paper be over or under right i mean that when, when you're married these things come into play the length of your skirt the length of your hair the length of a sermon <laughs> these things can do, divide us and there's no point <coughs> learn to let it go let it go don't even bring it up and then some things are not worth fighting over forgive anyone who offends you then there are honest to goodness sins that we do to others and others do to us comments envy gossip slander jealousy even hatred or lust and these are sins that happen to you somebody sinning against you or you've sinned against someone else or you're watching somebody sin against somebody else forgiveness does not mean the sin and the hurt that happened to us is justified forgiveness doesn't happen only if the one who sinned asks you to forgive them forgiveness is something you give yourself forgiveness is a gift you give yourself as a Christian the first part of forgiveness is realizing who are you to judge Jesus forgave you so you must forgive others Jesus forgave me of all those private thoughts all those stupid things I've said all those things I did all that I live in a constant state of sin that's something you need to understand we don't measure up at all to the holiness of God we are in a constant state of sin and Jesus is forgiving us so how can we not forgive someone else remember pride is always behind unforgiveness humble yourself and it's a lot easier to forgive someone hurts you cheats on you or talks bad behind your back remember without Christ we are far worse than anyone knows and we are actually deserve nothing but hell I love this quote forgiveness is a gift you give yourself if any man thinks ill of you do not be angry with him for you are worse than he thinks you to be and you know what I this this is this is very biblical because our hearts Jeremiah says our hearts are deceitful nobody knows how bad they really are and this has helped me because when people criticize me I immediately think oh I'm worse than you think I am and sometimes I say that you know what I'm worse than you think I am and they look at me well how can you be a preacher well I have Jesus that's how the only good thing about me is Christ everything else I'm hoping is dead and I and I work hard to kill Carson moment by moment by moment and the only thing left is Christ and the only thing good about me is Christ and that helps you stay humble when somebody criticizes you you realize if any man thinks ill of you do not be angry with him for you are worse than he thinks you to be Charles Spurgeon good old Charles Spurgeon forgiveness is essentially the choice to bear the injustice done to you and accept the consequences of somebody else's sin towards you and put it in the hands of God you're not saying it's okay what they did to you you're saying I accept it and why do I accept it because I'm worse than they think anyway and Jesus forgave me and without Christ I have nothing and I accept the criticism or the sin or stealing from me or lusting at me or whatever it is they're doing to me I accept it I choose to accept it and I put it in the hands of God and if God wants to pay back that person he will but I am NOT gonna build a homemade tank and go destroy that guy's house I'm not gonna do evil for evil right Romans 12 19 to 21 dear friends never take revenge 
Leave that to the righteous anger of God, for the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Colossians 3.14, above all, clothe yourselves with love. Above all, the biggest thing, the biggest point, the biggest foundation, and the Bible is full of this. Jesus said, a new commandment give I unto you, that you love one another. All the way through the Bible, love your neighbors, love God, love your neighbors, love God, love others, love God. All the way through John, John is always saying, love each other. They will know we are Christians by our love. So what is love? What is love? Clothe yourselves with love, which binds all of us together in perfect harmony. Love is patient. Clothe yourselves in patience. It's easy to be patient if you think about how patient Christ has been with you. How patient has he been with you? Can we extend that to others? So we need to love new Christians that are still drinking or still doing drugs or still swearing. We need to love them. We need to be patient. It doesn't mean we're okay with getting drunk and getting high and, and swearing and you know, but we are patient. So today, Adrian said, his friend Timothy, we're patient with Timothy. He says, Timothy, you gotta come to church and you gotta look like us and you gotta talk like us. No, we're patient. So he's sitting there swearing at, at his table. Adrian is patient with Timothy. And I think we need to be patient with each other. None of us have got it together to you. Surprise, surprise. None of us have it together. We have to be patient with each other. We have to be patient with somebody that gossips. We have to be patient with somebody that actually thinks they're better than you. Be patient. God will deal with that. God will deal with that. Pray about it. You spot problems in other people, pray about it. But always, what did I always say? Check your own beard first. You know, it's easy to say you got ketchup in your beard, but what about my beard? Maybe I got ketchup in my beard. Check your own heart first. That happens to me all the time. It was just the other day, Sue says, hey, you got, I think, I don't know what it was. I, it was, I think it was a half a chicken was in my beard or something. <laughs> and I said, what about your beard, <laughs> you know? Love is patient and kind. These are decisions, you see? Love is a decision. Clothe yourselves in love. Make the decision. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Not jealous. Wow. Jealous? You know, the other day I heard somebody was taking their family to the gospel chapel, and I was like, why are you going to the gospel chapel? You know, what's wrong with our church? And then I said, no, no. They're, they're going to see Jesus. They're, they're going to learn about Christ. They're, they're, that, that, I'm happy about that. If I hear they're not going to church at all, you might, you might get a knock on the door. Jealous, boastful, or proud, or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of being wronged. Doesn't bring it up ever again. I'm getting better at that, but that, that one, I, I sin at that all the time. Somebody wrongs me and I bring it up from 20 years ago. You know, what a waste of time that is. And what about me? What about my past and my sin and my mistakes? You know, it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. So, confronting in love is always preceded by prayer and self-examination. Holy Spirit led, delivered with a humble heart, grounded in biblical truth, saturated with love. So, like I said earlier, there's a lot of things not worth fighting for. We just forgive each other's faults. We let it go. But there are things when they start hurting people, and especially if it's hurting people other than yourself. If it's hurting yourself, let it go. Jesus had his beard ripped out for you. Jesus had his body completely ravaged by torture for you. Jesus carried your sin and had the wrath of God. I don't think we know what that means. The wrath of his father on him for you. So somebody's upsetting you, somebody's sinning against you, remind yourself what Christ did for you and let it go. But if somebody's hurting others, Jesus always stood up for those people. And usually, it was religious people that were hurting others. 
See, if somebody's hurting others, then we need to, first of all, pray. And self-examination says, do I, I'm, I see that sin in that person, is it in me? I'm looking at my own beard. Is that sin in that person in me? That's the first thing you ask yourself. And then, Holy Spirit led. God, do you want me to confront this person? You pray about it. You don't confront anybody without the Holy Spirit leading you to confront them. And then, you deliver it with a humble heart. So this is not humble. That's not humble. You know what? I don't want to embarrass anybody here. But one of the very best times that I've ever been, had somebody confront me in love was, was Ella. She phones me up and she talks to me and it's just oozing love. She's telling me about how her own past had experiences and things that she learned and how it caused problems in her own family. And she cared about me. She loved me. It was well done. And I'm not going to get into details. When you actually love someone and you're concerned for them and you're confronting them, nine times out of ten, you will get a, a better friend out of it. Sometimes, and Proverbs tells us this, sometimes if they don't accept what God is telling you to tell them, then they'll, you'll get a division. But we can confront. I hope that we love each other enough here that we can confront anyone in love if the Holy Spirit. So there's two things. Forgive each other's faults and learn to get over it. And then there's times when we do need to confront in love and delivered with a humble heart is how you do it grounded in biblical truth that one can backfire on you because I've had lots of people it says here this and that's why you're wrong it says here this and that's why you're wrong well that's what the Pharisees did right the Pharisees just went they used scripture Satan even used scripture so just because it's scripture doesn't give you the upper hand on the argument it's still got to be grounded in humility and love and that's how Jesus did it, right? Think about that. We talked about this last week. The woman at the well. He didn't say, you know, you're with five guys and now you're living with a guy and you better get married right now. And what about your kids? And you should drink less. And he didn't say that. He just says, I have rivers of living water for you. You're never going to be thirsty again. You're never going to be looking for love in all the wrong places again. I'm your answer. And I think we need to learn from Christ. So we're basically there. Colossians 3.15, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. Okay, I'm going to make this really quick. And there's something that Bob always says. Peace is your umpire. Peace is your umpire. When you're making decisions and you're, you're going, should I confront this person? Or, or even, should I get this job? Or should I say this? Or should I sing this song? Or should I marry this person? Or should I you know, serve as a Sunday school teacher. When you have peace, you're in. When you don't have peace, you're out. It's that simple. When you're in the will of God, you will have peace. Peace is your umpire. Strike or out. An umpire. When it's peace, you're in the pocket, you're in God's will. You should be able to discern that on your own. And it really does work. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. That's what's ruling you, is the peace that comes from Christ. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. If we don't have peace with each other, we are not in God's will. I am really proud of this church. I see a lot of peace with us. I see a lot of love. And a lot of broken people, a lot of mismatched people, a lot of people that don't belong anywhere. And you're welcome here. Boy, I love that. I love this church for that. And please invite everybody. Keep your eyes on heavenly things. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. God's will will always produce peace. Your will will always produce anxiety always produce anxiety. 
So now, from now on, should I buy this? Should I not buy this? Should I marry this person? Should I not marry this person? Should I get a divorce? Should I not get a divorce? Should I get mad and slam the door? Should I not get mad and slam the door? Should I go home and weld a homemade tank together? If you don't have peace, you're not in God's will. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust you and whose thoughts are fixed on you. And last point, always be thankful. This is Colossians. So earlier, Paul said in chapter 3, always think about heavenly things. Always think about heavenly things. So always be thankful. So right off the bat, I could tell that Helen has peace about her, her experience with the doctors. And her daughter, who loves her very much, doesn't have as much peace as Helen has. And that is common because you love your mom. Right? I get that. So we're praying and we're thanking God. But Helen's going, oh, I'm in the hands of God. I can tell that. I'm in God's hands. So if I die, I die. And why is he doing this? Maybe I'm supposed to get through to the doctors. Maybe I'm supposed to learn something. I don't know. So we, we got our eyes on heavenly things. So thank you, Lord, for this challenge in my health. Thank you for this challenge in my health. And thank you, by the way, that it's baffling the doctors. And thank you that your grace is, is sufficient for me. So we're thanking him. How can we thank God that Katie is 24 years old and it looks like she's dying of cancer at this time? Isn't that right, Winnie? 24 years old. Well, we can thank God for the 24 years she's had. We can thank God that she's, she's probably faced with, with some eternal decisions. When you know you're dying, you're either going to believe and reach out and cry out to Jesus or you're going to not. You're going to get angry and bitter. But we can trust that God is doing something eternally for her and for the family around her and for her friends. We can always be thankful because our God is in control. Whatever circumstance, we can always be thankful. Keep your eyes on heavenly things. Trust Him. Pain produces maturity. Poverty produces faith. Emptiness produces reliance on God. Failure produces wisdom. Great loss produces great opportunity. Persecution produces endurance, death, produces life we can always be thankful we must make the decision to love to be patient with each other to forgive each other's faults to love we must make the decision to love when it comes to confronting and pray about it before we confront and make sure that we are confronting with a humble heart saturated with love and we have checked our own hearts before we confront anyone else we got to give it to God we got to choose to love, choose to forgive, choose to focus on the positive, encourage instead of condemn, bind together instead of divide. We are all in the same boat, the same level, the boat is sinking, we need Jesus. Some of us have reached up and cried out to him and some of us haven't. That's the only difference. We need each other. Young, old, new, mature Christians, Charismatic Christians, conservative Christians, old school Christians, modern Christians, we need each other. Jesus binds us together. Love binds us together. High energy people, soft spoken people, we are one. We are his children. We are his church. Let's love one another as he loves us. So the whole world around us will know who he is. Lord Jesus, help us to love each other. Lord, help us to forgive each other's faults. Help us not to go build a tank in our hearts and pay back people evil for evil, but help us to let it go. Lord, not to be consumed with negativity and hate and bitterness, but to be consumed by you with love and patience, to be kind, not to remember each other's faults, to forgive the way you forgave us. God, I ask that you would just saturate this church with love for each other and that they will know we are Christians by our love. In your name, Lord, amen.